This is my newest clock design. It is a Steven Universe clock. It is going to be several layers deep. Uh, this is the base layer cut, which is going to be cut out of one quarter inch wood, which is already sitting on the laser cutter. It's thicker and makes a good base because it, you know, holds its form really well and doesn't flop or bend like the one eighth inch wood. The other pieces will be cut out of one eighth inch wood. That's this stuff. And it's going to be several layers deep. The red lines are cut lines, whereas the blue ones are just etch. So those are basically so that I know where to put this next layer. Like this is the base layer for the rose, and then this sits on top of it, you know, where the blue lines are. Uh, and then this sits on top of it. And these will be at the number points. These are the different gems. We've got yellow diamond. We've got um, uh, rose quartz, I guess. Uh, and then we've actually got pink diamonds up here. We got blue diamond, we got peridot, got jasper, bismuth, opal, lapis, uh, we got ruby and sapphire and amethyst. And all of those will get cut out and they will be glued in place where these are, which again is just an etch to let me know where to put things and because I haven't bothered to remove them from the wood. But you know, it doesn't matter, they get covered up. So let's actually get started and cut this thing on the laser cutter. First lines being etched here are at a super low power setting, only 3% power, so they're barely even drawn into the wood. The cut line is at 100% power and moves at only 20% of the normal speed. So not only is it using the full 60 watt power, but it is also moving slower so that the laser is in place over the wood longer. This is what lets it cut all the way through. This time the cut speed is only 50% normal since it's cutting through 1 8 inch thick wood instead of 1 quarter inch. It doesn't take nearly as much power to cut through this. Fresh out of the laser, time to sand it. This base piece is going to be left as plain wood and polyurethane, so it's especially important that its surface is nice and smooth. And now for the rose pieces. These will be spray painted and then polyed. It's still important to get a smooth finish here, but the paint will act as the initial primer and it'll fill in a lot of the wood pores that the first coat of poly would usually do. Sanding little tiny pieces like this with a radial sander isn't the easiest and arguably not the best idea anyway, because it can pull them right out of your fingers and send them flying if you're not careful. But I was too lazy to be bothered doing it with sandpaper by hand, so this is what I did. So now on to the painting process. The rose, as I've said before, is going to be several layers deep. The largest layer is the darkest color. Next piece is just pink. The little triangle piece in the center is also darker and I nearly forgot it, so here it is. Center piece is a very light pink. It almost looks white here, but it really is pink. Now onto the gems. First is pearl. I'm going to be doing a white base coat here. I'm going to let it dry and then I'll do more details later. Three of the gems are blue, so I'm doing those three at once. Sapphire and blue diamond are both using basically the exact same color schemes, but for lapis I'm using a little bit more of the lighter blue. I use pieces of cardstock and some different pieces of scrapped wood as impromptu masking objects. With the cardstock, if I hold it a short distance above the surface and I spray, I get a more fuzzy gradient effect. If it's placed directly on the gem and spray painted, I get a sharper line. Of course, I have to occasionally worry about the spray paint glowing the piece that's masking it off and sending it flying, but oh well. There's blue diamond done. I wasn't super happy with sapphire, so after I had let it dry a couple minutes, I took another crack at it. Happier now. Now that the white paint is dry, I'm going to put some color onto pearl. I'm just putting some hints of color into a curve along the one side. First a bit of yellow, then some coral, and a little bit more white to soften it with a gradient effect. Jasper is pretty simple. Yellow base, orange shadows along the side, and the bottom bits. Pink diamond and rose quartz gems base coat. I'll apply masking tape and add some more details to these after they've dried. Ruby base coat. I'll be using masking tape on this one too. Same with amethyst. 
Yellow Diamond was simple enough that I did the shades and the highlights without having to let things dry and mask it with tape. Peridot was a bit more complicated, but still mostly straight shapes, so I could work with that. Anyway, I think you get the idea, so let's move on to the next step. Time to apply the poly to the painted pieces. Since the paint acted as a base layer, even the first coat of poly can get pretty high gloss, but I'll still end up doing two coats on a few of them just to get the shine I'm after. Everything has had time to dry now, and there's definitely a nice and high shine. But you can tell that they're not as smooth as I would like on a couple pieces. There's plenty of little bits and bumps that I'd prefer weren't there, so I'm going to be taking them over and doing another sanding pass and then another poly pass to get the shine I'm after. It also occurred to me here that I apparently neglected to record the process of putting polyurethane on the base piece. But honestly, it's nothing different than the rest of the stuff you've already seen, so you get the idea. So back to the radial hand sander. This time I'm going to be using a rather high grit sandpaper to get the smoothest finish I can. I'm using 600 grit. One by one until every piece is done. Doing tiny pieces like these gems takes a delicate touch. If you're not careful, you're gonna end up sanding both the paint and the poly right off the edge. Sanding this piece of the road, you can really see how extra scuffed up the sanding makes it look. It's easy to see this for the first time and think you're ruining it, but all of those light scuff marks will vanish the second you put on another coat of polyurethane. And the undersurface will now be super smooth, so the poly will form a super smooth high gloss surface on its own. Time for the second coat of polyurethane. Before that, however, I'm going to take a bit and try to remove as much of the sanding dust as possible. I do this both with compressed air and by just wiping it down with a paper rag. Dust and other tiny particles are the enemy of a high gloss finish. First I apply the poly to the wood back piece. Now I'm applying it to the middle pink piece. The other two pieces were fine with one coat, so I left them alone. And on to the gems. I'm using a toothpick here to hold the gems in place on the table while I apply the polyurethane. This way, I'm not going to risk getting my fingerprints onto things while I hold them still. Everything is dry and done. Now to actually glue them into place. Just regular wood glue. You may notice how I didn't apply any poly to the center bit of the main clock back. This was mostly to help guarantee that the glue will actually bond and hold. Wood glue will still stick to the poly surface, but you get a much better bond if the barrier isn't there. Same thing with the next layer on the rose. Then the lightest pink part. And finally, the little inner triangle. Big heavy weight to hold it flat while the glue sets. Time to start gluing on the gems. Blue diamond. Amethyst at two o'clock. This was also when it registered that I had the whole thing upside down, so I spun the clock around for my own sanity. Jasper coming in at four o'clock. Peridot at five. Rose quartz at six. Bismuth at 7, then Lapis, Yellow Diamond for 9, then Pearl, Sapphire, Ruby, and finally Pink Diamond at 12. Shiny. Now to make this clock into an actual clock. I'm using a simple and standard battery operated quartz mechanism. If you get one of these kits, they usually come with a little black rubbery piece that should go on first. It should be between the mechanism and the base wood. This mechanism is 11 sixteenths dial thickness, which is the longest shaft I can generally find. So first thing on the front is the metal washer. Then the threaded nut. If you ever make a clock with the setup like this, make sure that when you're screwing this nut onto the shaft that you don't over tighten it. If you over tighten it, you'll end up getting weird problems and it's likely that it won't keep time very well. I often find it's easier to hold the nut in place and then twist the movement on the back. When I feel it's getting snug, I'll do the last adjustments with the mechanism on the back to make sure it's lined up properly. This clock movement has a wall hook built into it, 
but some others have a separate metal hook, so make sure you don't forget to put that on when you're assembling things. Time for the hands! First part you put on is the hour hand. It's the largest hole and it just presses down into place. The minute hand has a long, narrow hole. If you look closely at the end of the shaft, you can see the part that it slides over and is also long and narrow, and make sure you line it up properly. To hold it in place, you use this tiny little nut. It is so easy to lose this thing, so be careful. Now, I do enough of these things that it was worth it to buy this little tool that holds the tiny nut while I screw them on. If you're only gonna make like one or two clocks, then it's really not worth it, because this thing is like 15 to 20 bucks, depending on where you get it. Anyway, with or without it, you need to make sure that you get this tiny little nut screwed on straight. And that won't be easy. It does not want to be straight. It will try to be tilted, so make sure you're really careful. These little nuts can also strip pretty easily if you screw it up, so take your time. And finally, the second hand just presses into place over the tiny central shaft. And that's it! Put in a battery to test it and make sure everything is fine. If you find that the second hand starts to catch at some point and it just goes tick, 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 tick in place, you may have the tiny nut too tight. If it's over tightened, the second hand acts funny. This can also happen if the battery is low. Yay! All done! I've been wanting to do a Steven Universe clock for ages now. I feel like the first time I saw the flag for the crystal gems with the rose symbol on it, I immediately thought, ooh, clock! But maybe I'm just weird like that. Anyway, finally done! I hope you enjoyed this video. I've got an Etsy store with this and other things like it. You can find the link down in the doobly-doo. Subscribe if you like this video and want to see more things like it. And check out my YouTube page if you'd like to see the other videos I've already made. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye!